Good afternoon and welcome to the conference plenary. My name is Hayley Stevenson and I'm a senior lecturer here in the Department of Politics at the University of Sheffield. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Professor John Dryzak back to Sheffield to deliver the keynote address to this 65th conference of the Political Studies Association. I'm very confident that for most of you in the room, John is a scholar who needs no introduction. Um, but it's also quite possible that not everyone in the room is fully familiar with the extent of John's contributions to different subfields of the discipline of politics. The political theorists are obviously very familiar with John's contributions to political theory, in particular to deliberative and discursive democracy. The environmental politics folk are obviously very familiar with his impact on the study of environmental discourses, the study of environmental governance. And the international relations folk would know John's impact on debates around global democracy. Of course, these subfields do sometimes meet, and the extent that they do has been greatly um, influenced by, by John's work. To engage with debates across the field is something increasingly rare in our ever increasingly narrow field of politics. To truly shape debates across multiple subfields through both empirical and theoretical work is a major achievement. And it's something that I personally, and no doubt many of you, have been greatly influenced, uh, have been greatly um, inspired by in John's work. Professor Dryzek has held a series of prestigious fellowships in Australia where he is now based. From 2008 to 2012, he held a Federation Fellowship while at the Australian National University. And he is now Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow and Centenary Professor at the University of Canberra. There he heads up the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance, which he established some seven or eight years ago well at the Australian National University. It was there that I had the very good fortune to work with John as a postdoc. Working with one of the greats was obviously a wonderful opportunity, but it was a particularly rewarding opportunity because John turned out to be one of the most humble scholars that I've known. Generous in his engagement with other people's work, from the new PhD students through to the distinguished professors. The Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance continues to be a beacon for scholars of deliberative democracy from across the world. Actually, John's own work and studies have taken him across three continents. From the north of England, at the University of Lancaster, where John graduated with a BA in Economics and Politics, across to the University of Maryland in the United States, where he obtained his PhD in Government and Politics, before going on to work at the University of Oregon. And then across to Australia, where he's held positions at the University of Melbourne, the Australian National University, and now Canberra. During this time, Professor Dryzek has authored and edited some 16 books and dozens of articles, racking up some 20,000 citations along the way. Some of this work has been translated into multiple European and Asian languages. Today, John is going to deliver a talk entitled Deliberative World, in which he'll take on the theoretical, philosophical, and practical-minded critics of deliberative democracy. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Dryzak. Okay, thank you, Hayley, for that uh, very generous in introduction. Um, as Hayley indicated, I am British, um, but this is the first time I've actually given a talk to the Political Studies Association of the UK. Um, so maybe I should explain why I've been away for the last 38 years. Um, I left the UK in 1977 when uh, my mentor from my days at um, Strathclyde University, Richard Rose, suggested it might be a good idea for me to do a PhD in the United States. Um, I think in those days it's fair to say that um, political science was much stronger in the United States than in the UK. I think the gap has um, narrowed uh, very considerably in the intervening years. Anyway, so I took uh, Richard's advice and went to the US. Um, in 1980, when I received my PhD, uh, Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister. There were no academic jobs in the United, sorry, there were no uh, academic jobs in the UK. Um, so 
So I stayed in the US. One thing led to another, and I never did come back. Um, so thanks to Richard Rose, I left the UK, and thanks to Margaret Thatcher, I stayed away. Um, but anyway, um, today I'm going to give a talk on deliberative world, which uh, is uh, really sort of designed to uh, well, both not just um, introduce those who don't know much about it to deliberative, deli deliberative democracy, but also to, um, uh, to try and look at some of its um, applications across different fields, and, and also its, uh, its future prospects. Um, so it's designed to reach from the basic, I will be saying a few words about what deliberative democracy is, to cutting edge, and there will be some of the content which is frankly speculative. Now, the title Deliberative World is not supposed to suggest that the whole world is becoming deliberative. Far from it. Maybe it's best to think of Deliberative World as a bit like Disney World. It's a, th it's a, th it's a theme park with a number of rides in it. Now, some people might find some of the rides exhilarating. Um, some of the rides may make some people want to throw up. Of course, I hope that doesn't, doesn't happen here. But there's a variety of rides. They take you, to, well, they, they're in different places. Um, they involve sort of different sorts of experiences. So I intend looking at a variety of them. Um, of course, we shouldn't extend the uh, parallel with Disney World too far. Um, unlike Disney World, Deliberative World is grounded in the real world in which we live, and it also has a critical edge in trying to reshape that, that real world. My treatment is going to be broad rather than deep. I'm going to try and visit several of the main subfields of the discipline, um, notably political theory, uh, comparative politics, and a bit about international relations. Uh, the talk isn't quite the same as promised in the abstract that's on the, on the web. Um, it's actually slightly narrower. Um, I, I was going to cover uh, encounters with rational choice theory and public policy analysis, but uh, I decided I didn't really have room for that, but I'm happy to talk about those um, should anyone be interested. So, let me start with some basics. The core claim at the heart of the theory of deliberative democracy is this one. Democratic legitimacy depends on the right, opportunity, and capacity of those subject to a collective decision or their representatives to participate in consequential deliberation about its content. That's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, to put it perhaps more simply, um, in the words of, uh, of Simone Chambers, it is a talk-centric rather than a vote-centric view of democracy. It is not hostile to voting in elections, but it puts communication at the center. And actually, it's not just talk. It's also listening and reflection, which are very important components of a deliberative democracy. And I'll have something to say about those in, in my talk. It is best to think of deliberative democracy as a normative project informed by empirical evidence. There's actually been an explosion of empirical studies of deliberative democracy in the last seven or eight years, which has informed the way the normative project is shaped. What this means is that deliberative democracy is not a set of hypotheses that can be tested, as was called for uh, notably by Diana Mutz in an article called Is Deliberative Democracy a Falsifiable, Falsifiable Theory, published in the Annual Review of Political Science in 2008. I think it's wrong to conceive in those terms. What that means is that, though, is that for somebody like Mutz who wants to treat deliberative democracy in hypothesis testing terms, there are a number of difficulties. By the time you've designed your study, gathered data, analyzed it, written it up, published it, then what you will find is that the field has moved on. Uh, it's developed uh, in, in new ways. It's, it's, it's framed core concepts um, somewhat differently. Um, so in recent years, for example, there's been a, a very rapid turn towards the idea of a deliberative system, uh, linking uh, different sites in an, over, an overall system, which um, can be interpreted in, and analyzed in deliberative terms. Um, that's a relatively new development. It's very different from the way the core theory of deliberative democracy looked around 10 years ago. So we learn, we change, uh, we respond to critics, we reformulate, we reformulate the nature of uh, what the we reformulate the nature of the project while retaining, of course, some core commitments to well, this this what, what I've got on the, the slide here. That's one of our core commitments. So what then is deliberation? Deliberation is a particular kind of communication. It does feature, feature and highlight mutual justification or the giving of reasons for or against positions and preferences held by the participants. But there can be more to it than that. I think that deliberation can actually can encompass a variety of forms of communication provided they meet these tests. They should be non-coercive, they should be capable of, in, of inducing reflection amongst listeners, 
that if anyone makes a particular claim, notably a self-interested claim, then they ought to be able to connect that to a more general principle. So for example, if you're arguing for uh, your material self-interest, then you should be able to um, couch that argument in terms of some kind of broader values, such as, for example, social justice. It should also feature what uh, leading deliberative theorist Gutman Thompson called reciprocity, which is an effort to communicate in terms that make sense to those who do not share one's own framework. So that framework might be religious, it might be ideological, but there, there should be an effort to reach across divisions so that one can communicate effectively with others who do not share one's, one's starting point. In this light, deliberation can include what Jane Mansbridge calls everyday talk, it can include the telling of stories, it can, it can include uh, rhetoric, it can include humour, provided, the, provided these forms of communication meet these tests. Let me now say a bit about the growing reach of deliberative democracy. I'll start with the President of the United States. And this is a quote from Barack Obama from his book, The Audacity of Hope, published in 2006, in which uh, he proclaims his interpretation of the US constitutional system of government as being, in essence, a deliberative democracy. I think it's fair to say that the sensibilities of, it, of his administration uh, proved much more technocratic than deliberative. Um, so we actually did, we haven't really seen a huge amount of deliberative innovation under the uh, Obama administration. In a very different part of the world, uh, key figures in the hierarchy of the Chinese Communist Party have endorsed deliberative democracy. This is a quote from um, Yi Xiaowen, um, director of the Central Socialist Institute in an article in the People's Daily. Um, his previous job before that was uh, Director of Religious Affairs, where part of his job description was repressing Falun Gong. So I'm not entirely sure what to make of the reference to um, openness and tolerance in the last, uh, uh, the last part of that quote. But this is just by way of illustration how far and wide the language of deliberative democracy has spread, even though the practice falls far short. And of course, um, uh, Yi Xiaowen. Um, had a very constrained view of deliberative democracy in mind, uh, one which certainly could not challenge the monopoly on power of the Chinese Communist Party. That said, there have been a, number, there have been a, a very large number of uh, deliberative uh, experiments in, in, in local government in China, which really have, uh, in some cases, well, in some cases, they've overruled the decisions of party officials. In some cases, uh, they've been adopted uh, straight into the content of, of local public policy. Deliberative democracy has also spread across many different disciplines. Now, it's often noted that political science as a discipline generally imports theoretical frameworks from other disciplines and very rarely exports them. In deliberative democracy, there is a two-way trade uh, between political science and many other disciplines. And I think the balance of, uh, the balance of trade is positive. Um, I think political science exports more, than it's in, exports more here than it imports. I'm currently crediting one of these huge Oxford handbooks. It's a 54 chapter hand, hand, Oxford handbook of deliberative democracy. Um, we have chapters in that handbook on, amongst other things, and I'll just list a few in different, few because it illustrates the interdisciplinary reach. We have chapters on political philosophy, philosophy of language, social psychology, decision psychology, sociology, policy analysis, planning, economics, law, criminology, Communications, uh, the leading communications scholar of deliberate democracy, um, John Gastel, is here in the audience today. Uh, media studies, science and technology studies, and conflict resolution. So these are just some of the fields where we find a lot of work on deliberative democracy. <coughs> but this is a political science conference, so I'll focus on applications in political science. I'll start with political theory and then visit the subfields of comparative politics and international relations. In political theory, Deliberative democracy has been the most popular topic over the last 15 years or so, if you just count articles in political theory journals. Uh, the only topic that comes close is, glo is global justice. Now, if you're a political theorist, the, the only thing worse than being criticized is not being criticized. That most of what political, well, not most, but a great deal of what political theorists do is criticize each other's work. So if you're being criticized, you know that you're successful. Now, uh, one gets used to being criticized by one's uh, enemies or adversaries or, one, one, or people from a different school of thought. Um, that, that's, that's, of course, comes with the territory. Um, it, it does tend to catch me by surprise, though, when we get whacked by my friends. Um, and I have one particular friend in mind there, uh, in the form of uh, um, Carol Pateman, a very well-known theorist of uh, political 
sorry, of uh, political participation, um, and also leading feminist political theorist as well. In her 2011 presidential address the, to the American Political Science Association, which she also gave as a talk to the Political Studies Association here, she had a go at deliberative democracy. Um, she laments, laments the, uh, sorry, laments the alleged displacement of participatory democracy by deliberative democracy. She zeroes in on, in particular, on the emphasis by deliberative Democrats on citizens' juries and citizens' assemblies, which are otherwise known as mini-publics. The basic idea of a mini-public is that you recruit a randomly selected sample of citizens, at least that will work for a citizens' assembly, because it's works with large numbers, around 150. Uh, for a citizen's jury, you have to stratify the random sample to make sure that you have all the relevant social categories uh, covered, because it works with smaller groups, 15 or 20 people usually. But um, both of them involve uh, these ordinary citizens uh, being gathered, being exposed to experts and advocates, uh, deliberating the, the content of, uh, of what should be done on a particular policy issue, and then issuing a recommendation and report. These are, this is, these, these are mini-publics. Uh, Pateman makes a number of criticisms of those, but the two most important ones are that these are essentially just one-off events which are not part of the regular cycle of politics. So they leave that regular cycle undisturbed. They also mean accepting and not challenging the broader institutions of, of limited democracy and also the larger political economy in which limited democracy is embedded. And of course, Pavement herself, as a participatory democrat, is a radical critique of, sorry, a radical critic of existing forms of liberal, liberal democracy, existing dominant forms. Okay, so let me say a bit by way of reply to Pavement. Um, the first thing is that she treats what is really just a part of the field of deliberative democracy as being more or less its entirety. Many publics have received a lot of attention in recent years, but there's much more to deliberative democracy than that. I think the best use of many publics is not necessarily to try to create a deliberative democracy, but rather to illuminate how it could work. Or they might play some role in a larger system. Um, just probably have an illustration here. Um, I mentioned that there's been a lot of empirical work on deliberative democracy in recent years. Um, some of that work suggests that uh, uh, Many publics do relatively, or citizens deliberating in many publics do relatively poorly when it comes to the deliberative virtue of justification, the making of arguments for positions and preferences, um, in comparison to, to legislatures, where, where, of course, members of legislatures uh, uh, do, do very well when it comes to justification of their positions. Um, but, but many publics do much better when it comes to the important deliberative virtues of respect and recognition. Sorry, respect, respect and reflection. So those respect and reflection are often what's missing in parliamentary debate. So what that suggests is that what we may need in any deliberative system is something like a chamber of justification and a chamber of reflection. Um, we can compare this with the, the jury in court cases. I mean, the jury is essentially a chamber of reflection. Actually, it's also a chamber of decision. Um, many publics need to be that. Um, but the justification takes place elsewhere, in the, in the court, on the floor of the courtroom, where you have uh, people whose job it is to justify, uh, to advocate um, particular positions. Now, in this light, um, the problem with my own Australia, and perhaps the, the US as well, is that in our legislative systems, we currently have two chambers of justification, the House and Senate, and really no democratic chamber of reflection. And that may help explain why legislative politics can be so unproductive, or, or legislative debate can be so unproductive. Um, in the US, if there is a chamber of reflection, it is arguably the Supreme Court. However, uh, two, uh, two problems with the Supreme Court. First, it is not a democratic institution. Its members are, are appointed for life. Um, and also, it's increasingly partisan. So really uh, falling down on its uh, reflective task. So what's the solution? Well, one solution might be to constitutionalize lay citizen forums, mini publics. This has been suggested in a book by my American colleague, Ethan Lieb, in which he proposes what he calls a fourth branch of government, a popular branch of government, essentially composed of citizen juries, which would deliberate legislation. Um, of course, that's, it's not gonna happen anytime soon. I mean, it's virtually impossible to change the US Constitution. Very, very, very hard, let alone set up a, uh, 
a fourth branch of government. Um, but it's at least an interesting idea to, to think about. Um, there might be sort of openings uh, in unicameral legislative, in, in unicameral legislatures, um, such as uh, Queensland, New Zealand, and Nebraska, none of which currently have an upper house. Well, wouldn't it be an idea to experiment with an upper house composed of lay citizens? Um, actually, something along these lines was proposed in 1998 in the context of debates um, over House of Laws reform by the Demos think tank here um, in, a, in a pamphlet called the Athenian Option, in which they suggested a lay citizen chamber as an alternative to the House of Lords. I actually think that's a good idea, but it seemed to uh, get very little traction in, in those debates at the time. Um, but anyway, we, we could think um, in creative terms of making lay citizen forums, mini-publics, part of the regular cycle of politics in Pateman's terms, and that would be an effective reply to, what, to one of her key criticisms. Um, uh, I attended a talk by John Gastel in London on Saturday in which uh, he, he talked about the, something called the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review Process. I used to live in the state of Oregon, um, and this, the, there they have uh, citizen-initiated referendum, uh, which um, uh, uh, essentially binding on, on the state government if, if they pass. What the state has done in recent years is um, require that, at least for some of the issues that appear on, the, some of the measures that appear on the, uh, on the ballot, uh, that, that, that a citizen's jury be convened to deliberate them and then write a report which goes in the voters' pamphlet to every voter who will subsequently vote in the referendum. That is an institutionalization of a mini-public and again, sort of makes the mini-public part of the regular cycle of politics, as, as Pateman calls it. Okay, now everything I've said so far about uh, inserting mini-publics into the deliberative system um, suggests, well, it, it, it really suggests that we can design deliberative democracy in some formal sense. Um, going back to the quote that I gave earlier by Barack Obama, um, he believes that uh, institutional design is something that once occurred in the American political system, of course, especially the constitutional founding, even if um, it may be uh, uh, very hard to do currently. Um, so I've, I've just highlighted a few words in the, the quote room in the, in the middle there, designed to force us into uh, a deliberative democracy. So he, he thinks that um, formal design matters. And everything I just said about inserting mini-publics into the, into the constitutional system uh, really emphasizes formal design as well. But formal design is only part of the story about deliberative democratization. I think the more informal aspects are very important too. In this light, the problem with the United States is not just its failing constitutional machinery, but also the content and conditions of engagement of discourses in its broader public sphere. This, in, this kind of engagement is especially consequential when formal institutions are either rigid and malfunctioning, as arguably they are in the US, um, or very weak to begin with, as they are in the international system. So I argued in a book that was published a few years ago called Deliberative Global Politics um, for the interpretation of global politics um, in exactly this light. Uh, the content and conditions of engagement of discourses is especially consequential in the global system, uh, precisely because formal institutions are often weak. Um, thinking of in global environmental governance in particular, if you want to understand the way that's worked over the last uh, 30 years, years or so, then the, the discourse of sustainable development has been hugely influential in coordinating the actions and activities of, of large numbers of actors. Uh, formal institutions are extremely weak when it comes to global environmental governance, so the, inf the more informal processes step in. Um, and we can think about how to, about democratizing the conditions of engagement of those, of those discourses. Um, in this vein, we, for example, we can criticize the domination of the international political economy by neoliberal discourse, uh, which is problematic on deliberative grounds because the logic of no alternative which it presents to states and other actors undermines the possibilities for effective deliberation. Now, in these sorts of situations, um, such as the one I've just characterized for the international system, uh, there may be no obvious points of leverage for institutional designers um, interested in int uh, making the system more deliberative, but there may still be an audience who on reflection can change the way politics works, in this case global politics, so one might think of uh, global civil society in particular. However tough in practice it may be for deliberative theorists to reach it. Anyway, whatever the mix of formal institutional design and more informal, critical or discursive 
analysis. Contrary to what Carol Pateman says, del deliberative democracy can be a radical and transformative kind of political theory, seeking deliberative systems that are inclusive, egalitarian, and consequential, as well as just featuring authentic deliberation. So, uh, one way of uh, sort of perhaps dramatizing my reply to Pateman is to say that uh, something like this, this is a, this is a mini public in operation, um, is not in itself a deliberative democracy. Uh, this is actually one particular mini public that I was involved in uh, designing and running, the Australian Citizens Parliament, actually one of the, more, one of the world's more ambitious exercises in citizen deliberation, which was held in 2009. But um, whatever its um, good, good qualities, uh, really, something like the Australian Citizens Parliament just constitutes one moment in the life of a deliberative system. It is not a deliberative democracy itself. Um, rather, if you're interested in deliberative democracy, then one has to think about how to integrate moments of critique, uh, and that really, uh, the, the, what I just said about the more informal, uh, discursive sphere, um, really, that's really where uh, critique comes in. Uh, justification, just the making of arguments on behalf of positions, uh, reflection as a key aspect of deliberation, and then decision in a process that is ideally um, as inclusive, egalitarian, and consequential as possible. Okay, so that um, gives a bit, perhaps a bit more precision to the normative project um, with, which I, uh, with which I began. Now, I'd like to illuminate the reach of that project by taking a tour through comparative politics and then international relations. Start with comparative politics. I think it's fair to say that comparative scholars of democracy have long ignored deliberation as an, an aspect of de democracy. Uh, that really began to change uh, rec in recent years. In a landmark article published in 2011 in Perspectives on Politics, Coppage and Gehring, uh, that the article is called Conceptual Conceptualizing and Measuring Democracy, Coppage and Gehring treat deliberation as one of their six conceptions of democracy, which, which together determine, quote, which elements of democracy are related to which results. And they've been, since then, they've been um, uh, 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 developing a huge cross-national data set. It turns out, though, that deliberation is a bit problematic for that data set because it's hard to come up with uh, uh, aggregate um, national-level indicators of deliberative quality. So it is proving a bit problematic in empirical terms, at least in conceptual terms. They, as, they, they, as uh, leading comparative co politics scholars of democracy, do recognize the deliberative dimension. Uh, that's by way of contrast with a panel at the American Political Science Association I attended a few years before that on deliberation and democratization. Um, I was presenting a paper on that, that panel. Um, it was also, the discussant was the editor of the Journal of Democracy, um, who heaped scorn on the idea that uh, deliberation had anything to contribute to democratization. Uh, that he was much more committed to a universally applicable model of democracy, which features electoral competition and human rights under the Constitution, in which deliberation has no place. Um, I think that deliberation can actually do a lot for democratization, and indeed democratization may be hard to pursue without uh, more effective deliberation. It can facilitate transition from authoritarian regimes to more democratic ones. Deliberative capacity building can occur under authorita authoritarian states uh, before democratic transitions. That capacity building might occur in oppositional public spheres. So think, for example, of the deliberative capacity developed by um, solidarity in, in Poland or uh, Charter 77 in uh, Czechoslovakia before the, in, in the 1980s. Um, it doesn't have to be in association with the state, so it doesn't have to be uh, proceed in the way that um, Yi Xiaowen, who I quoted at the outset, uh, thinks deliberative democracy should be, uh, should be pursued. In moments of crisis, deliberation can play a role. So Jan Elster, for example, has analyzed roundtable talks in transitions in Poland and Hungary in deliberative terms. Deliberation could also occur in social movements accompanying democratization. Um, so thinking of the recent protests in Hong Kong recently, uh, were very, the, the participants were often very, very self-consciously deliberative in their relationships with each other, but also the relationships they sought with, uh, with people outside the protests. Of course, that didn't actually lead to any democratic transition, but one can imagine um, a movement like that uh, uh, in conjunction with, with a transition. When it comes to the consolidation of democratic regimes, 
New democracies often face deep divisions on ideological or religious or ethnic grounds. In those sorts of deeply divided settings, deliberation can contribute to conflict resolution and social learning across deep difference. Um, my Swiss colleague uh, Jörg Steiner has uh, run deliberative processes in Colombia and Bosnia, featuring, featuring both cases, um, people who uh, uh, were ex-combatants on, on, on different sides of um, civil conflicts. Uh, what he finds there is that uh, um, ordinary people, in this case, uh, in the, at least in the Colombian case, ordinary ex-combatants, uh, are often more willing to deliberate across div to divides than are their political leaders. So the challenge then becomes to extend that positive finding uh, from the particular forums that, that, that Steiner set up uh, to uh, the larger citizenry and to political leaders. <coughs> political leaders can sometimes be exemplary in deliberative terms, though, in, in, uh, in new democracies, in transitional democracies. Uh, we're in the Mandela room, so I'll refer here to Nelson Mandela, whose picture is over there. Um, who was exemplary in constructing rhetorical bridges across the different, different, different uh, sides in a racially divided society, which helped facilitate a more deliberative system by bringing people in, into the system from, from, different, uh, from different sides of the racial divide. Okay, um, let me just now take a brief look at another popular concept in comparative politics, social capital. Now, I think most people who've thought about this would regard social capital and deliberative democracy as being mutually reinforcing. Both <coughs> seem to prize civic engagement. However, tensions between social capital and deliberative democracy emerge once we recognize the more contestatory aspects of deliberation. So let me refer now to two, two studies of the United States in these, in, in, which, which help illuminate this, this tension. Um, the first one is uh, the work of um, Nina Eliasov, uh, who has done ethnographic work on, um, on uh, uh, really on ordinary people and their attitudes towards politics in the United States. She's, uh, her landmark book is called Avoiding Politics. Um, in some cases, uh, what she finds that even speaking of politics in a social setting is, is, seeing, is seen as hierarchical and elitist, as actually disrupting social harmony and disrupting social capital. Diana Mutz, in her book, Hearing, Hearing the Other Side, uh, argues that deliberation suppresses partic political participation. Um, she, her survey findings show that the more, an in, the, more likely, the, the more an individual encounters and communicates with others who do not share that individual's political point of view, the less likely he or she is to participate in politics. So in that sense, um, encountering differently minded others uh, suppresses political participation. Um, and again, that suggests that uh, deliberation, at least its more contestatory aspects, uh, can undermine social capital, at least in the, at least in the US. Okay, um, let's try and put the US in comparative light here. And here I'm gonna be um, a bit speculative, and uh, this is uh, not uh, fully empirically grounded. Um, the US starts to look very problematic in deliberative terms. Um, if Mutz and Eliasoff are right, then there are problematic features of the, of the political culture, as well as its national institutions and its public sphere, um, as, as indicated in my earlier comments. So the US may, on some dimensions, actually have a lower de deliberative capacity than places like, for example, uh, Botswana, where the legitimacy of, of public officials depends on their performance in public forums, not on the mere fact of their being elected. It's the public performance uh, in actually confronting and engaging with the public that is much more important. Um, or think of Brazil, which is actually a hotbed of deliberative innovation. Uh, participatory budgeting is the most well known, uh, but there's, there are, there's all kinds of deliberative innovation when it comes to, for example, um, municipal uh, health service councils. And also, uh, Brazil's social movements um, um, often feature a high level of deliberative capacity too. Um, or think of India, which is home to what is arguably the world's largest design deliberative in institution, uh, the Gram Sabha, which is, uh, uh, the Gram Sabha is a state mandated village assembly. Vijendra Rao and his colleagues have done a, a lot of work on how these assemblies play out in South India. Actually in North, in North India, which tends to work out very differently. But at least in, in South India, 
according to Rao and his colleagues, the Gram Sabbas are really quite exemplary in deliberative terms. What they also enable is, is, is for lower caste individuals to participate during the, during the assembly itself as though they were equal with higher caste individuals. So in terms of performing as equals, it has a, a, a kind of leveling function. And also, according to Rao, um, can have an impact on the content of local public policies, especially when it comes to uh, policies relevant to, um, to, to, to social welfare. So um, all that's by way of um, making one, one point, really, which is that del deliberative democracy's home is not necessarily modern, liberal, democratic Western societies. Deliberation, I would argue, is a universal competence, but it can be manifested differently in different cultures. And what that means then is that there is a need to investigate deliberative cultures to see how deliberation is manifested in these different terms in different parts of the world, not just in different, different countries. We shouldn't necessarily confine ourselves to a national level of analysis. Um, and I intend uh, working on that, amongst other things, uh, over the next few years. Okay, so much for comparative politics. Let me turn to international relations. Now, a door from the mainstream of international relations to deliberative democracy uh, was opened a few years ago um, by Thomas Rieser in a classic article published in an international organization called Let's Argue. Although actually, uh, deliberative Democrats um, had been attending to the international system before that article was published. Um, what what Rees says though, is that in international relations, there is a consequential logic of argumentation. In other words, uh, international relations is, is, is not just about strategy, it's not just about um, compliance with social norms, it's also about persuasion and argumentation. And he has lots of examples of um, how persuasion has made a difference in, uh, in international negotiations. What this means then is that we can start thinking about uh, international relations and global politics in terms of deliberative order constituted by deliberation itself. And it's, it's possible actually to analyze whole systems of global governance in deliberative terms. Um, yeah, Haley's here on the platform with me, so um, I'll uh, just put in an advertisement there for a, a book that we wrote together and was published last year. Um, now, that's an analysis, that book is essentially an analysis of global climate governance uh, in deliberative democratic terms. It, it analyzes the system of governance as a potentially deliberative system. Um, I won't uh, even begin to try and summarize what's in the book, um, but one thing we, we do find is that, uh, you know, what, what I talk about the importance of the engagement of discourses in the public sphere in global politics earlier. Um, currently, we often find that that engagement is often very limited, that there are enclaves of particular, um, in, in which particular discourses dominate. So for example, um, uh, social movement gatherings are, are dominated by, transnational social movement civil society gatherings are dominated by green radical discourses. Uh, gatherings of businesses who actually care about climate change and want to do something about it are dominated by a much more uh, moderate sustainability discourse. Uh, but often those two don't engage in productive, well, they don't engage at all, let alone in productive ways. And often um, they themselves are divorced from what goes on in the official uh, UN negotiations. Matters are even worse when it comes to the more informal governance networks which are now proliferating in global climate governance. Um, often uh, any kind of uh, public sphere or public spa space in which uh, uh, different discourses might flourish um, is completely missing. Instead, they're very low visibility affairs um, uh, in which uh, um, corporations and sometimes, and, and, and sometimes governments uh, produce, produce policies, but without uh, anything much in the way of input from any, any larger public, let alone any, any, any global public. Now, uh, climate change itself is just one aspect of global environmental change. Uh, the, 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 the challenge of global environmental change is increasingly encapsulated by Earth scientists under the heading of, or the concept of the Anthropocene. So that's why I've got onto the Anthropocene um, there. The Anthropocene is an emerging epoch of human-induced instability in the Earth's system. It puts humans at the center of causal processes in social ecological systems. Okay. 
And because it puts humans at the center, a lot of the Earth scientists who've engaged the process believe that the Anthropocene, the proper response to the Anthropocene is, is planetary management of the global social ecological system. Um, I would argue, in contrast, that we should think about deliberating the Anthropocene uh, as a way of enabling a much more democratic response to this emerging epoch. Um, I've argued, well, begun arguing to that effect um, in a paper called Institutions of the Anthropocene, which is forthcoming in the British Journal of Political Science. Anyway, it is possible to think of global democratization in deliberative terms. Now, recently, leading international relations scholar Robert Cohane has been heaping scorn on the idea of, of global democracy um, in a lecture he gave at the LSE recently um, and in other, other venues. I think, though, that Cohane makes two fundamental errors. Um, the first error is that he sees democracy in the image of an idealized liberal democratic state featuring elections, the rule of law, national solidarity, and civic engagement. Um, and so he, treat, he treats global democracy as having to be in, the, in that kind of image. The second error is that he treats democracy in all or nothing terms. You either adopt something like that at the global level or you don't do anything. Um, I would agree with Cohane that global electoral democracy is currently a non-starter. It's hard to imagine global elections. But global deliberative democratization is both multifaceted and feasible, and it can always be seen as a matter of degree, of gradually introducing uh, deliberative innovations and processes into the global system. Okay. Um, Let me, uh, before I conclude, um, uh, try and put the, the, the spread and the growing reach of delib deliberative democracy in perspective. Um, I've argued that its reach is indeed um, substantial and growing, um, but there are worries that can accompany this, this spread. I'm going to draw a parallel here with the history of liberalism in political theory. Uh, both liberalism and deliberative democracy have shown a substantial capacity to absorb their competitors. Now, liberalism historically has absorbed, for example, socialism uh, in the form of social democracy. Um, it's absorbed critical theory. The key move there was uh, the publication by Jürgen Habermas of his book, um, Between Facts and Norms, just over 20 years ago now, um, in which uh, Habermas, the critical theorist, became, started to look very much like Habermas, a liberal constitutionalist. Um, there are similar stories which can be told for egalitarianism, communitarianism, feminism, republicanism, and green political theory all of which liberalism has tried to absorb. Now, in each case, the absorption has been partial and it's been resisted by other adherents of those, uh, of those theories. Uh, but there's no denying that it has, uh, that it has been, um, it's in some ways, quite successful in bolstering the, uh, the fortunes of liberalism in political theory. Now, deliberative democracy, too, has been capable of, avoid, of, 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 of absorbing its critics and its competitors. So it's absorbed aspects of uh, agonism, um, ag agonistic democracy, which emphasizes the contestatory aspect of democracy. Uh, I've stressed in this talk that del deliber deliberation includes contestation too. It's ab absorbed aspects of participatory democracy, uh, non-deliberative non social movement activism, which turns out to be possibly functional for deliberative systems. It's absorbed aspects of parliamentary democracy, multiple forms of communication, not just arguments. I mentioned earlier it's absorbed uh, rhetoric, uh, uh, the telling of stories, testimony, and so forth. Um, but the, but the, the worry that comes with that is that we become too encompassing, that we lose our distinctiveness. I mean, in some ways, that's, what happened, that's what's happened with liberalism, and the same thing, the same danger, I think, applies to deliberative democracy. So I think what that means is we need to cultivate and maintain our critical edge, and remember what deliberative democracy is not. It is not part of the neoliberal political economy. It is not bargaining. It is not cheap talk. It is not the mere aggregation of preferences. It is not hierarchy. It is not distorted communication. Now, deliberative, democ deliberative democracy also faces a world which often seems quite intractable and in which democracy seems to be in retreat on several fronts, I mean, in, in different parts of the world, you know, Russia, the Middle East, um, East Asia, and a loss of democratic com confidence in the, the, the more long-lived liberal democracies as well. Um, so how do, we, how do we react in the face of that intractable world. Almost a century ago, uh, Max Weber referred to politics as involving the slow boring of hard boards, that famous quote. But he then went on to give advice about political action in such an intractable world. Actually, he called it um, a world too stupid or too petty. Um, but he says, um, in the face of that, we, 
actually, he, he says in the face of that he, but um, I think it's better, of course, now much better to say in the face of that we. In the face of that we must have the resolve to say and yet. And this is where deliberative, deliberative democracy now finds itself as a normative project, which I think should be radical and transformative, although I recognize that some of my colleagues disagree with me, um, facing an intractable world to which it must continually say and yet. And yet there are positives. I've talked about some of them in this talk. The Gram Sabas in South India, the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review as a way of, uh, of uh, institutionalizing uh, many publics in a, in a deliberative system. Um, and maybe clo close, to, close to here, um, for perhaps the closest thing that uh, we've seen in, uh, in practice to deliberative democracy and actually in this part of the world recently, uh, think of the campaign on the referendum on Scottish independence, where it seems at least for a few weeks you had the whole of Scotland deliberating. Um, now, the real challenge is to advance deliber deliberative democracy, not on relatively simple and straightforward matters like Scottish independence, but where I think we really need it. For example, in deeply divided societies, when it comes to the promotion of global justice, when it comes to the effective global governance of climate change, and confronting the still more uh, problematic challenge of the Anthropocene. Okay, so let me just leave you with uh, a few key messages. Deliberation is a universal human capacity uh, manifested differently in different cultures. Deliberative, deliberative democracy is, is I think, uh, a properly transformative and critical normative project which is informed by empirical study. It shouldn't be treated as a set of hypotheses to be tested. Global democracy is more readily, readily conceived of in deliberative rather than in electoral terms. But, but, capacity, but, but deliberative capacity building is actually vital to democratization uh, anywhere, at any level, from the local to the global. Um, and as I've just said, I think the project needs to prove itself on big, complex, intractable issues um, like global justice, like the problems of deeply divided societies, like how to confront the challenge of the Anthropocene. Um, I'll finish that. <laughs>